things. I mean, being teachers, I think if you want to be a teacher, if you do want to become a teacher, better read the, these books uh, from Douglas uh, H. Brown and Richards, Richard and Rogers books. So that I'm going to talk about it during our session. So this is the book that I've, I've just mentioned, which is from H. Douglas Brown. Teaching by Principles, an Interactive Approach to Language Pedagogy, and it's uh, in its third edition, which is from 2007. Okay. Talking about the history of language learning and teaching, it's not getting back too late on time. But anyways, we have to get back a century ago in which modern languages used to be teach. What, what exactly modern languages used to be? They were, as you probably already know, uh, Greek and Latin language, in which Latin was taught just to, as a mental gymnastics and not exactly to develop communicative skills. So it was um, used to use loads of grammar explanation, repetitions, and lists of vocabularies without any connection. But during our discussion today, we are going to be talking about what do you mean by the term method? What are the methods, methodologies? What are the differences between methods, methodology, techniques, etc.? And how do methods reflect the various trends? Because we will be since we are teachers of English, we have to try to vary our classes with different methods and techniques so that we get a, a best way of learning from our students. And how does current research in language learning and teaching help us to distinguish passing feds and good stuff? You can interrupt me anytime you want, or if you feel like, so just signalize or you can just say something to inquire, to ask any questions if you like. And second, language acquisition, some references, and then I'll, I'll, I'll be opening for discussions. It's gonna be kind of theoretical stuff today, and I must admit that it's some, uh, somehow a bit uh, boring sometimes, but it's interesting we cannot go over without discussing at least little bit of this kind of thing. So in the century spanning the mid 1880s to mid 1980s, so one century ago, the researchers were considered methods. All things were considered methods. Uh, when it comes to language learning and teaching, everything was called method. In 1963, Edward Anthony defined the terms approach, method, and so it was the definitions that lasted longer than any other ones that, that they were resistant to time. According to Anthony them from 1963, approach is a set of assumptions dealing with the nature of language learning and teaching. Okay, everything that the teacher or the professional, let's put it this way, the professional deals in terms of the language in uh, in terms of learning and teaching a foreign language. In our cases, we are talking specifically about English language, but it can, can apply to any other um, foreign language. So an approach was considered a set of assumptions dealing with the nature of language learning and teaching, while method was considered an overall plan for systematic presentation of a language based upon a selected approach. So what do you mean by saying that, teacher Alex? That a teacher would um, choose the methods or the, the techniques based on an approach that would be considered a beliefs and assumptions that would be considered the most effective, the most, um, yes, effective in terms of that uh, in terms of leading the process of learning and teaching a foreign language. So technique was also considered and defined by Anthony as specific activities manifested in a classroom that were consistent 
with a method and in harmony with an approach as well. So these concepts, these ideas developed by Anthony in 1963 were considered the um, a milestone of theoretical stuff in terms of teaching a foreign language. A couple of decades later, Jack Richards, that we are going to use as well as a reference, and Theodore Rogers, 1982 and 1986 proposed, I mean, from, yes, uh, during this period in 1982 and 1986, proposed a reformulation on the, on the terms approach, design, and procedure. And they led this to two contributions, which were the specification of the necessary elements of the language teaching that they called design, uh, which had been left vogue up to the moment, and the representation, representation sorry, of methods described and six important features of design, which were objective, syllabus, activities, learning roles, teachers' roles, and the role of instructional materials. So they also contributed and introduced these aspects, these very important aspects in the process of teaching and learning a foreign language, which were the learning roles, the teachers' roles, the role of instructional materials. So it was not like, like just more, I'm going to teach a foreign language and I'm going to use a material or I will create a material, a syllabus or curricula, and I will do it the way I want as teachers used to do in the past. So they define what is the importance of the learning in this process? What is the role of learning? Learner, sorry, sorry in this process, process. What is the role of the teacher in this process? And which would be the most effective material or the most, the most effective syllabus curricula according to various uh, different purposes of learning uh, acquisition? So these were the contributions that, uh, I mean, the main contributions that Richards and Rogers gave us uh, in this process of teaching and learning a foreign language. So they nudged us into at last relinquishing or thinking about and being curious about the notion that separate definable discrete methods are the essential building blocks of methodology. Language designs, which, are, which is the curricula or the process or steps that we will follow during the process of teaching a foreign language, various procedures or techniques, all kinds of activities that we use to teach a foreign language are considered techniques or procedures. And the methods are restrictive, too restrictive, too pre-programmed, too protect. Um, so it was like creating an umbrella covered everything necessary in terms of science, which had been left vague up to that moment. Okay, so they started to, to transform into science, this process of teaching and learning a foreign language. But they have led us to the conclusion that methodology is our umbrella of everything. The method is something more specific. What is the methodology used by the school X or the teacher Y or the professional Z. So what is the method, which is something more specific? And taking into account uh, the learner's role, teacher's role, okay, and an effective material that would be, uh, that would fit the student's needs or specific student, student's needs. Designs are the curricula or syllabuses, as I, uh, I've just mentioned, okay, the materials that would be uh, more effective, that would fit the students' necessities, taking into account also that we, uh, 
we have different perspectives when our students come to us, they have different aims, different objectives. So defining curricula and syllabuses started to be something to take uh, as a priority. Methodology, pedagogical practice in general. I mean, that's it, sorry. Approach would be considered the theoretical, well-informed positions and beliefs. Method, a generalized set of classroom specification for accomplishing linguistic objectives. Curriculum, or syllabus designed for carrying out a particular language program. The methodology would be, what do I believe that's going to be the way or the most effective way of learning? Okay. Method, what is, uh, what is the way that I'm going to lead the entire process in a specific course of study in a specific uh, semester or year? So the designs would be, which topics am I, am I going to teach my students? What is the sequence, the sequencing, the pace? Etc. The methodology then would be the practices in general. Am I going to give a reading? Um, is it going to be based on the communicative approach, etc.? Um, well, approach would be then well informed, well informed positions and beliefs. How do I believe, or what do I believe, is the most effective way of teaching? Should I use songs? Should I teach my students through all the videos, through reading? Should I teach my students the way they learn uh, their first language? So everything that you believe for every position that you take and that you consider effective to a student or to a group of students or to a specific groups of students, then it's considered approach. The method, a generalized set of classroom specifications for accomplish, accomplishing linguistic objectives, which would be um, how long each class is going to last. So it's, is it going to be two hour class, three hour, one hour and a half? How am I going to lead each class, should I teach them, I mean, the students using loads of grammar explanation? Should I teach my students using games, songs? So this is considered method, which is a generalized set of classroom specifications for accomplishing linguistic objectives, including the age of my students, the specific purposes of my students, are they going to be uh, students who are in need of getting a job, business students, young learners, children? And curriculum or syllabus, the language program. Nowadays, we have modern materials that brings everything step by step. So this, when you open your book, you start teaching a semester or a new course, what you see uh, in the first pages is the curriculum or syllabus, which is uh, the contents that will be presented in a book. So moving on, the techniques of our, our, a variety of ex exercises, activities, or tests, all the activities used by a professional is considered a technique. Um, so let's get back again on time to see which methodologies and approaches uh, were developed or were in use in some specific points in the past. And let's get started with the grammar translation method. I'd like to ask um, some of you, how have you learned the language? Let me ask you, Lidmila, please, if you are not shy, but anyways, uh, uh, we'd love to hear from you, and I'm quite sure that you will contribute a lot to our course. 
So how have you learned your communicative skills? I mean, how have you learned the language? In our case, the target language, which is English. Or you can tell us a little bit about the first classes that you had in English. How did you get interested on learning more about the language? And how your teachers used to teach you the language when you were a learner, let's say. So uh, I started actually getting interested when I was a teenager. That it was when I started my course. But before I started uh, taking an English course, I was already very curious. So uh, when I listened to a song or something like that, I always wanted to know what they were talking about. So when I started, I, I had a lot of vocabulary, but I didn't have the grammar or the oral skills to have a conversation. And these, the first classes that I remember, my God, it's so long ago, <laughs> I was 16. <laughs> um, but I think the, we started with the, actually the pretty obvious, like how old are you? What's your name? And we, mm -hmm. my teachers tried not to use the translation, for example. They mm -hmm. tried not to. But, and then when I started, I tried not to use the, the translation with my, my students. But as I told you, there was some things that was working, some things that it wasn't working. So now I have, depending on which students I have, how they are going, I changed the method a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I understand. Okay, uh, let me ask you another question. Uh, mm -hmm. Did your teachers used to teach you through dialogues, reading, explaining? How did they explain? How did they use explain? I mean, sorry. How did they use to explain grammar in our classes in our language classes? Um, I can say that we had some sections on the book, so mm -hmm. it was the first usually used to be a reading to introduce the, the topic of the day or something like that. We used to do the reading. After that, we used to do the listening and we used to repeat uh, the listening or some words. And then when we had everything in a context, then we used to go to the grammar. And then it was a very specific part of the class it was only grammar. And then exercises. Okay, that's great. Thanks, thanks, Ludmila. You, Natalia. Natalia, how uh, or what did your teachers used to do or to use during your language languages classes or language classes? Well, my language classes were mostly English and reading. They talk, um, so mm -hmm. that's all that I remember. They speak, I spoke a lot, of, a lot of Portuguese to explain the grammar, but I think it's for me it was easier to learn mm -hmm. reading than than listening. Okay, got it. Thanks, Natalia. Okay, all of the things that you said, you guys said that your teachers used to uh, to do to you in your uh, language classes, we are going to see in the different approaches and methodologies from the past to the present. Okay, so the first one to be mentioned is the grammar translation method, which is pretty common up to the present and probably even either you or me or any other students who had come through this process probably had faced um, this uh, approach, which is the grammar translation 
method. That is, in the 19th century in the Western world, that's what I also mentioned, to teach a foreign language means to teach Latin or Greek to adequate higher education and as a mental gymnastic. And that moment emerged the grammar translation method, which is classical method used when other foreign languages start to be taught. I mean, so previously, uh, Latin and Greek were the languages taught, and then when other languages appeared, like French, Italian, and German language, and I, I'm talking about United States, okay, and some other countries in Europe, when other foreign languages started to appear, the same grammar translation method continued to be used to teach these languages. So what is it, what it means exactly? That the same approaches were used, which which were uh, teaching uh, as uh, ad adequate higher education and as mental gymnastics. Uh, it was called later by the grammar translation method also. But what are the characteristics of the grammar translation methods? The classes were taught in the mother tongue, so this is the main characteristic. And I must admit that many teachers and many schools to use these techniques and approaches from the grammar translation method, not only in Brazil, but in many other countries in the world, much vocabulary is taught as a list of isolated words to be memorized. Long, elaborate explanation of grammar. Now you know that when your teachers used to get to class and give you or give us a list of 300 or 400 or something irregular verb for us to memorize for a test or for the other class, we know that it comes from the grammar translation method. Long, I'm not saying that this doesn't work. This is just something that's well known um, among teachers and among institutions, languages, languages institute, institute. This is very interesting because it might not be so effective sometimes because our students may get um, addicted to reading and to the written form of the language, but it works, it still works and it's still uh, widely used for many, as I said, many teachers and institutions. Another characteristic of this approach was that long and elaborate explanation of grammar, they, they believe that grammar provided the rules to put words together. So it's, law, it's also considered what we know nowadays as the academics English. Reading of difficult classical texts is begun early. So what is it, what is it exactly? Teachers used to give students complex texts and pieces of uh, written forms of the language, but the students just have to, I mean, the students just had to um, translate, just to memorize those texts without not necessarily interpreting them or knowing exactly what they were learning. So it was considered heritage, was considered scholar. Little attention is paid to the contents, the contents of the texts. So when they used to study classical and difficult stuff, they just had simply to memorize and try to um, acquire that defined pattern, to try to use those structures in their real lives, but just in case. So the only drills were exercises in translating disconnected sentences. You probably remember when your teachers um, came up to classes with those old dictionaries or when he used to give us exercises to translate some texts or to use translators to 
translate sentences, isolated vocabularies, and so. Nowadays, it's still being in use. This is, uh, some of the, these are some of the characteristics of the grammar translation method. And little or no attention is given to pronunciation. It wasn't the focus, it wasn't the aim of a language classes, oh, sorry, of a language class to teach conversational skills. So the pronunciation uh, was given little attention. Then in 1800s, Francois Gouin, a French Latin teacher with remarkable insights, so he used to love languages as, as, as we do. And then he decided to learn German language in those days. He was not considered the founder of the language teaching methodology because his influence was overshadowed by uh, whom everybody knows, Charles Berlin, the founder of the direct method that we are, that we are also going to talk about. Hugo One was a French teacher who decided to, to learn German language, but in a bizarre way, nowadays they consider that it was the, his attempts were quite bizarre because he tried to master a German language grammar book in a table of 248 irregular German verbs in 10 days just by memorizing them to learn the language, thinking that he would be able to go to streets in German and talk in German. He decided to move, he got a, um, he got a course of studies. He, he decided to go to the academy in Germany. So to be able to communicate, he did this bizarre attempt, which were, which, sorry, which was to try to, trying to memorize a grammar book and a table of 248 uh, irregular German verbs. And he thought, okay, now I'm, be, I'm able to communicate. And of course, he tried to communicate and he wrote in one of his books, it was a total disaster. He couldn't understand a single word of what uh, German people were saying. So then he got back to his room yet in Germany. He tried to memorize the grammar book again and another, uh, another book another German book, plus other hundreds of vocabularies. And of course, when he went uh, back of his room, when he went to the streets to try to communicate, people would start laughing at him. So it was a total disaster for him. The experience was gruesomely traumatic. But as a teacher, he never, he has never given up. So he decided to get back to France and started to observe his three-year-old nephew. And then he wrote a book talking about his experiences, trying to learn German language, and also the observation that he had uh, made of his two, uh, I mean, three-year-old nephew, there's a typo here, it's missing an E, sorry. So he thought when he saw his three-year-old nephew talking like a veritable chatterbox of French language without even knowing how to read and practice the self-study, he thought the key of learning a foreign language is uh, a child. How come a three-year-old child learn a language and be able to communicate in such a natural way without knowing how to read because we as adults, we can read, we can get information, we know how to, uh, uh, how to learn by ourselves simply by reading and studying and uh, up on different things. And a kid, uh, especially a, a child who is still learning to communicate 
to come up with a perfect intonation pronunciation and such uh, interesting uh, language skills. So he wrote in one of his books that the child must hold the secret of learn, learning a language. So he came to the following conclusion. Language learning is a matter of transforming perceptions into conceptions, what children do. Use the language to represent their concepts. So language is a means of thinking to represent the world to other people. So a child transforms the perceptions into concepts. So throughout observation, and of course, effort, the children, uh, uh, the child, I mean, is able to communicate. To, to express their thoughts to people around. But how does this uh, work? So this was the first attempt of, of teaching languages in different ways because he, in Go on, the French teach, the teacher, um, the language teacher, decided to create a method in which would uh, he would use some patterns to teach a person speaking a foreign language without giving translation. As a child learn uh, learns his or her first language. For example, if a parent, father or mother, doesn't teach a kid throughout a grammar book or through uh, memorizing a list of words or vocabularies or verbs, et cetera. So he created a set of, of sentences that would be necessary to start teaching foreign language without uh, translating or without memorizing list of isolated words as the grammar translation method would preach. Some of the sentences that he created was like, um, I stood up or I stand up, I walk to the door, I walk toward the door, I stand in front of the door, I put my hand on the handle, I turn the handle, I open the door, etc. Showing these movements and concrete vocabularies so it would be like easier for them to learn and to get um, this kind of structures and master them and use it in a practical way. But Charles Burley created the direct method, which would be like something that he took from Go On and transformed it into science in a more uh, organized way. So in the direct method, the classroom introduction, intro, instruction, sorry, was conducted exclusively in the target language. But of course, he observed Go One's ideas, he decided to, uh, to create something because he, he could see that it was possible to teach a foreign language without, uh, I mean, the same way a child would learn his or her first language. So everyday vocabulary and sentences were taught as Gowen had created, like sentences that could be possible to understand without translating. Oral communication skills were built up in a carefully created uh, progression organized around questions and answers between teachers and students in a small intensive classes. But it was okay at this moment because oral it's introduced small intensive groups to the language teaching because up to this moment the classes are the classes were the same classes that we have nowadays that are traditional ones in, in public in some private schools with classes full of students 30 maybe 40 students in the same classroom which was quite impossible to teach them using this direct method organized by Berlitz. Uh, Berlitz languages schools nowadays is well recognized 
many different countries or I would say all over the world. Our communication skills were built up in a carefully traded, okay, I've talked about this already, already. Grammar was taught inductively. How do parents teach their children? By teaching, by explaining rules on how to use it or how to use grammar. No, grammar is taught through or is learned throughout observation. The child observes patterns surrounding them. So they transform these patterns and throughout feedbacks, they can come up with development. They can uh, use the structure in an appropriate or inappropriate ways according to the language he or she is inserted in. But of course, it demands time, effort, and it doesn't happen from the day to night. Grammar, this is, uh, is something interesting to consider because when you teach grammar inductively, it means that you are not exactly teaching your students rules to put words together as the grammar uh, translation method used to, to do. But how to teach grammar inductively? Uh, throughout observation, throughout modeling, you show, when you show your students or when a parent, for example, shows his or her uh, kids how to come up with an appropriate sentence according to grammar rules, it's even more effective than if you just keep teaching rules to your students or to any person. So new teaching points were taught through modeling and practicing. A creative vocabulary was taught throughout demonstration, objects and features, and abstract vocabulary was taught by associ association of ideas. Well, I'm fly, so I'll try to move on faster. Both speech and listening were taught. So Burley, it's also introduced the teaching of listening skills and also the practice of the speech, which was up. Uh, which had been left uh, unconsidered up to the present moment on those days. So correct pronunciation were emphasized, was emphasized and also uh, correct grammar or grammar according to the, the nature of rules. Let's talk about now the audio lingual method which was emerged in the United States and influenced by the Second World War. Imagine you going through a job interview, okay? First, you have all the requirements to get the job and you are the perfect candidate, but you need to be interviewed in a second language, let's say English. Are you really ready? And then the interviewer, interviewer can ask you, are you really ready to speak in English, for example? Let's get started this interview in totally in English because I do need to know if you are good enough to get the job. I mean, in terms of knowing the language, in terms of communicating. And not even this, you have to be able to communicate like a native or native like like a native like a native speaker without or at least with a minimum influence of your mother tongue or uh, with the maximum accuracy so that you won't be noticed you are a non-native speaker and more if you can come up with what we want in this company you will pay not only losing the job, but also with your life. This is what can be considered the audio language method because since it was influenced by the Second World War, it was also called army method. The army, the United States Army, decided to create faster intensive classes because uh, their soldiers needed to be able to communicate 
So what did they what did they introduce? New material was presented in dialogue form. So they introduced the teaching of languages in forms of dialogues because uh, in those days it was very difficult to to the United States to get foreign teachers or teachers of foreign languages um, who would be here or who would come from Europe, which was not that difficult in Europe. So new material was presented in form of dialogues, independence, uh, mimicry, memorization of set of phrases and over learner, over learning, sorry. So the learning needed to be done fast or faster because the war was already um, clothing. So the soldiers needed to learn the language the faster they could. Structures were sequenced by means of contrastive analysis and thought at one time. And then some structures, uh, some characteristics, characteristics of the audio language method were structural patterns uh, were taught using repetitive drills, repetitive drills because they needed to get fluency, accuracy, and pronunciation, intonation, native like. There is little or no grammatical explanation. Grammar is taught by inductive analogy rather than deductive explanation. So people or the soldiers or the learners needed to learn grammar well, induction, uh, I mean, inductive in an inductive way, like trying to observe and get the knowledge. Vocabulary is strictly limited and learned in context. And there were extensive use of tape. This was another important thing that the military um, approach introduced. They started the uses of tapes language laboratories. Also, some more elaborated visual aids. So this was uh, the main contribution that the audio, audio language method brought uh, to our uh, teaching and learning uh, um, science. Great importance is attached to pronunciation. It was really important to pronounce words well and intonation native like, because uh, as you could observe in the war, if you can't communicate, if you are in a spy, for example, and you couldn't communicate well in the foreign language, you could be with your life. Also to communicate with the uh, allied troop, would, you had to be able um, to communicate well. So great importance was attached to pronunciation. Very little use of the mother tongue by teachers was permitted. So very little, it doesn't say here that it wasn't allowed. Successful responses were immediately reinforced. And there were great effort, sorry, there was a great effort to get students to produce error-free utterances. So the students, needed to speak or to produce a perfect language without any errors. This was another um, important contribution of the audio language method because the students would acquire more fluency and more accuracy. It's important to say that fluency is the way you speak the language naturally. So talking naturally, uh, means fluency, and talking the way the grammar says that we have to means accuracy. So talking a language correctly, using it in an, uh, in an appropriate way according to grammar, it's accuracy, and talking it naturally means fluency. So it's, uh, they are two different things. They are together. But there was a tendency to manipulate language and disregard content. Of course, learning the language 
was necessary for war. So teachers and the directors, the supervisors would manipulate the language for the objectives they had on those days. Another approach is the cognitive code learning, which was created by Tomskin and revolutionized the ALM. So it seems that one approach, one methodology is overcoming the other. Okay. But of course, it as one new methodology or as one new approach appeared, it used to take the good stuff from the previous one. So it wasn't necessarily something totally new. So Chomsky revolutionized the audio lingual method created by the militaries, in which he introduced the structure of the language. It began to inject more deductive rule learning into language. Uh, some critics say that it got back to the audio, I mean, the grammar translation method. So it wasn't necessarily something new. And the drilling typical of the audio lingual method but added healthy doses of role explanation and reliance on grammatical sequency of materials. It was pretty much the same or lots of characteristics of the um, grammar translation method. It was a reaction to the strictly behavioristic access of uh, audio language method and ironically return to some of the practices of grammar translation. So as you can see, a new approach appeared, but it was a mix of all the other um, characteristics of the previous ones. And then in 1970s, started the creation of what we, we know nowadays as the designer methods of the spirited 1970s. First one was the community language learning. So they, as people or the professionals or specialists on those areas on those days started to try to create new things. They started, they also created some like more uh, abstract stuff. So in the community language learning, not, it, it, uh, there wasn't a class, but a group in need of certain therapy and counseling. What it means, the teacher would be the counselor, and the teacher would be the therapist. The students were there and the teacher would provide like um, if necessary, mental comfort to the student. Social dynamic of such group was priority. So it was like a community of sharing experiences, not only good experiences or not only teaching and learning experiences, but they would also uh, share their personal ideas and their personal problems and of course, um, achievements. Teachers should focus on the necessity of the client. So the students, so, so one of the characteristics uh, that, something that we added, if you can say that if it was new, was that the students then were considered the clients and it started to, let's say, transform it, to, transform it into market or developing marketing in this field of expertise. Um, so the teacher used to act as the counselor, not as a threat. And they gathered together in an educational community to be consulate, not only to learn a language or a foreign language. And the suggested period derived from the Bulgarian psychologist George Jordi Lozano in 1979. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to mention about the main characteristics because we just have 20 minutes to go. Um, and then we can continue tomorrow. States that the human brain could process great, great 
quantities of material if given in the right conditions for learning, among which are a state of relaxation and giving over of control to the teacher. And in the suggest suggested period, teachers used to play music to make the students relaxed. So they used the yoga techniques, which were baroque, in baroque music, the exact 60 beats per minute, and written create a super learning atmosphere. And the super learning atmosphere is to increase of alpha brain waves and decrease of the boot pressure. So it was like the students would go there to sleep in the classes. Let's read this passage uh, or these passages taken of the book, taken out of the book uh, from H. Douglas Brown. At the beginning of describing the suggested video, which is very interesting. At the beginning of the section, all conversation stops for a minute or two, or two and the teacher listens to the music coming from a tape recorder. He waits and listens to several passages in order to enter into the mood of the music, music and then begins to read or recite the new texts. His voice modulated in harmony with the musical phrases. The students follow the text in their textbooks, uh, where each lesson is translated into the mother tongue. Between the first and the second part of the concert, there are several minutes of solemn silence in some cases. Even longer pauses can be given to permit the students to steer a little. A little sorry. Before the beginning of the second part of the concert, there are again several minutes of silence and some phrases of the music are heard again before the teacher begins brother, to read the text. Now the students close their textbooks and listen to the teacher's reading. At the end, the students silently leave the room. They are not told to do any homework on the last thing they uh, have just had expected, uh, expect for reading it, uh, cursorily once before going to bed and again before getting up in the morning. Do you think, do you think it would create any learning? I don't know. This was something that was uh, in out of the purity 1970s. The silent way created by Kelly uh, Gattino had a humanistic approach. And the learning was facilitated if the learners create or discovered rather than remembers and repeats. So learning is facilitated by accompanying or mediating physical objects. Learning is facilitated by problem solving involving the material to be learned. So uh, one of the characteristics of the silent way is that the teachers would keep in silent most part of the class and they would give the students um, problem solving games. So the students needed to use some specific materials to try to solve some problems and try to learn the language by resolving this problem. And one of the um, materials that we used were known as, uh, let me show you here the image, as you can see, uh, these are air rods. These materials here, which are rods in different sizes and colors that we use to teach vocabulary, like colors, size, material and some structures like references, word order, adjectives, and etc. So the silent way was um, recognized by the silence of the teacher. That's why it was called silent way. Nowadays, something that we have a lot and I can observe in many classes of many different, different teachers is the total physical response created by James Asher in 1977. 
principles of a child language learning process, the students did a great deal of listening and acting. The teacher was very directive in orchestrating a performance. But in this mean of orchestrating, teachers would be just uh, like errors or um, they would act just in the imperative mode, order this, ordering the students to do things all the time, basically all the time. So the teacher used the imperative mood and humor was used. Another characteristic of the total physical response and some uh, syllabus nowadays use it a lot, especially for kids using uh, comments or imperative mood and humor to teach kids to make them uh, produce some movements, especially using the foreign language. 1980 uh, appeared the, uh, the natural approach developed by Tracy Terrell. And it was considered the, uh, the essential for triggering the acquisition of a language. The initial task of the teacher was to provide comprehensive inputs, and it was not necessary for the students to speak until they felt read, ready to do so. So the teacher in this process only used to give used to give instructions and instructions and explanation until the students um, got ready to speak or felt that they would be able to speak they were able to speak. The teacher was a source of learners input and creator of, of an stimulating and interesting variety of activities, comments, games, skits, and small group work. Notional non-function syllabuses uh, it was not a method exactly, it was a curricula that the attention to function as organizing elements of English language was given, sequenced grammatical structures, notions are general abstract or general, sorry, notions are general abstract concepts and a specific contexts or situation. Responded to language functions, identify, reporting, denying, accepting, declining, asking permission, asking permission, apologizing, etc. were listed 70 different language functions. So this introduces the way we, what we can consider more modern in terms of what we know about teaching a foreign language. So if you open the book um, and see the contents of the book, you will see different language functions, uh, greeting, introducing, giving personal information, answering and asking about personal information and etc. So this is the main characteristic of the notional functions coordinators.